Good morning, fourth period. Well, I'm going to do something a little bit different, and I miss um, seeing you guys. I miss calling roll. I miss saying good morning to you. So today I'm going to actually say good morning to everybody, and I'm actually going to call roll just to have fun, make my life, my, this video a little bit different than some of the other ones. Make sure you're paying attention to the videos because I'm going to ask you questions about the video, just kind of random stuff. So, but I'm going to start by saying good morning to everybody. Good morning, Franco. Glad you're here. Good morning, Oz. Good morning, Molly. Good morning, Finch. Good morning, Jaden. Good morning, Emily. Yes, Jaden, you can go to Bose. Um, good morning, Christina. Good morning, Piero. Good morning, Harlan. Harlan, how's baseball going? <clears throat> good morning, Matt. Good morning, Valerie. Where's Romeo? Not here again? All right. Well, tell him I miss him. Good morning, Hannah. Good morning, Jesse. Good morning, Jasmine. Good morning, Kelly. Good morning, Bernardo. Good morning, Megan. Good morning, Maddie. Morning, Malika. Morning, Justini. Morning, Morgan. Good morning, Jacob. Morning, Hugo. Morning, Jackie. Morning, Luke. Luke, will you tell your friend to get back to class? Thanks. Morning, Daniela. Morning, Jesse. Morning, Fernando. Morning, Julian. Morning, Tyler. Morning, Riley. Morning, Caitlin. Morning, Abby. Morning, Alexis. Morning, Sierra. Morning, Cam. Morning, Cassie. Glad you guys are all here. <clears throat> Hopefully you're having a great day and um, staying safe and staying healthy. Um, this is going to be our lecture for chapter 22. So chapter 22 is going to be talking about relationships, um, whether it's symbiotic, symbiotic relationships or good relationships. I'm also going to talk a little bit about sex, sexual reproduction, how that happens in the ocean and with some of the different things. Um, so when you have two or more species that are going to have some sort of relationship, as long as it's a relation, a positive on one side and not a negative on the other, then it's going to be a symbiotic relationship. Well, they're all going to be symbiotics, but there's different, different, some different types of symbiotic relationships. Um, <clears throat> so when a species, um, are you in a relationship? Probably some sort. Yeah, we all are. We all have different relationships and they change constantly, right? So when um, the relationship between a species is beneficial, it's going to be to at least one of them, and it doesn't hurt the other one, it's going to be symbiotic or symbiosis. Um, a relationship between the same species is going to be an intraspecific relationship. So if you have a boyfriend or girlfriend, that's going to be an intraspecific relationship, or if you have a relationship between your mom and dad, or your brothers and sisters, or your friends, since we're all the same species, <clears throat> that's going to be intraspecific. Um, so a relationship where one benefits and the other one is not affected at all, there's no harm done, there's no other benefit done, it's going to be called commensalism. And this happens a lot of times like with sharks um, and the little fish that swim right by the sharks. So the shark is not affected by the little fish and the little fish actually gets protection from the shark. And then it also gets to eat all the leftovers that after the shark has eaten because then it's just floating in the water and just kind of gets to eat there. So it's kind of a benefit. So you have a predator that's protecting the shark or the little fish, and then, but there's no effect on it. Um, some of the other marine critters that this happens with are like sponges. So in a sponge, um, you might have crabs or you might have um, worms and other invertebrates that might kind of hang out in the sponge. Doesn't hurt the sponge. Sponge just kind of goes, yeah, whatever, and just kind of goes about its day. But it's being protected from other critters or other predators that might want to eat those critters. Um, so when it's, but when both species benefit from the relationship, it's going to be called mutualism. That's what our relationships with our boyfriends or girlfriends or husbands or wives or whatever should be. Even our friends should be mutual. So that means that they're going to both be given a better chance for survival. Um... So that's going to be good and really important for a lot of animals because they, they need that help and they need that benefit. Kind of like we do. We need our help. We need our benefit. The social distancing is killing me. Um, and even very deep in the ocean, near the thermal vents, there's actually an entire ecosystem that is reliable, relying on a mutualistic relationship with a giant tube worm and a bacteria. Bacteria, what? Bacteria, as you know, some of them are good. Um, so we know that the sunlight can't get that deep in the ocean. We know that it doesn't penetrate past I don't know, 10, 12, 20 feet, 30 feet. We already know it's pretty dark out there, right? So they have to be able to make food down in the deep ocean. So um, the, there's a lot of really good minerals that come off the water from the thermal vent. 
So th there is a chemosynthesis that occurs with that bacteria, which allows them to make food. And that actually supplies the whole web down there. The, that means crabs and shrimp and clams and on even some fish that live down there are all fed off of this um, chemosynthesis that occurs there. So if the, the bacteria and the giant worm didn't have this mutual relationship, um, then this wouldn't occur and those wouldn't be down there. Um, in a symbiotic relationship where one species is harmed and the other is benefited, it's going to be called a parasitism, um, like for a parasite. That's not a good thing. So if you're in a relationship that someone's always taking from you, always, always take, 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 and they never give back, that's kind of like a parasite. Get rid of them. Now chop them out. Get out. Okay? Um, because you're known as the host. Um, this happens a lot like with a mosquito or any type of bacteria that needs a host to be able to reproduce, kind of like the COVID-19. Needs, needs us as our host to reproduce. Okay? Um, and an example, another example is going to be an isopod parasite, parasite that actually attaches onto the squirrel fish. So that isopod actually can kill or it can actually um, do a lot of damage to that squirrel fish by, by attaching to its head and then kind of doing some damage to the blood or whatever else it's going to do damage to. Um, and the isopods are a crustacean. It's a pretty wide variety of crustaceans. Um, some of the other crustaceans are going to be like crabs and lobsters. Um, and they're very diverse because they can kind of live any, everywhere and anywhere. Some can even live in the freshwater and saltwater, whatever. They can live kind of everywhere. Parasites can be either in or out. Um, they don't have to be outside attached. They can be inside. A lot of times we have parasites within our stomach. That's how we get sick. Sometimes parasites will live there for years and years and years. And we have no idea that they're even there because they don't do any harm to us until we either um, start to get ill or we get fatigued or we get really stressed out. And that's when problems occur. So that's when our parasites um, will actually become a problem. And that's when we need to make sure that, um, that they aren't going to do anything worse to us. So, and then when fish are caught before we eat them, um, they're actually checked for parasites and worms to make sure that's not passed on to us. Okay. Um, so one of the things that I'm going to do in this video is show you kind of random things in my house. So in my bedroom, I actually have, um, a kind of like an ocean theme. And so these are from my pillows. So you can see I have coral, I have some shells on there, and then I have a nice clam shell. Um, those are just some of the things that are on there. So I might ask you about those on your questions for this chapter. Um, also, this is my dog. Luna, say hi. That's Luna. Yeah, he's a little crazy. So we're going to move on to coevolution. So when a species competes to um, cooperate with each other, they'll develop traits that help them respond with each other. So the most common one that we know about is going to be the clownfish and sea anemone. So what Nemo, basically. We know that Nemo likes to live in the sea anemone. And we wonder, how can Nemo live in the sea anemone when that is going to sting him? How, how does that not kill him? Well, over time, because he had been stung so many times, they have developed um, a... a mucus outer covering on their skin or on their scales so that when this they get stung it doesn't bother them it doesn't hurt them at all so <clears throat> this has happened over several generations it doesn't just happen overnight kind of like some people do with like snakes or they do when you're allergic to something sometimes they try to give you a little bit of it or even when you get your flu shot or whatever um your vaccinations they're giving you a little bit so you can actually reproduce more um antibodies so if it sees it again it gets rid of it um, another type of coevolution is going to be predator and prey. So obviously we know that prey is going to try to get the weakest one. So weakest link usually gets eaten, right? We see that on the gazelles all the time on the, on the animal channels. The lions and tigers and bears, oh my, um, will go after the weakest link. So that happens with predator and prey in the ocean. So as the predator is going after the prey, they're going to catch the slowest one. 
Well, that is going to ensure or that's going to create the prey to actually get to swim faster. So they're going to have to swim faster so they're not eaten. So then they have now swim faster and now the predator now has to swim faster to be able to catch his prey. So it's this constant circle that's a vicious circle going around and around and around. You go faster, I go faster. You go faster, I go faster. So it might be kind of cool. Um, the reproduction cycles. How do they reproduce? How do they create more of them? Well, there's a lot of different ways. Um, if an organism needs a partner, it's going to be sexual reproduction. If it doesn't need a partner, then it's asexual reproduction. So just like plants on, on the land, um, which I have quite a few of, few of in my backyard. So, so we have some outside plants here. Just like these plants, they have buds. Um, they get usually flowers first and then some, they'll bud up um, and then they reproduce that way. So some of them do that. And then just like the sponges in the ocean, they will actually bud first and then they will have new reproduct or new pieces of sponge. And it's gonna be exactly, they're gonna have the exact same, um, uh, they're gonna be exactly like their parents. So the same traits, everything else. This can be bad because there's no diversity. So if something happens, then they don't change. And then they can't change and they don't survive. So that, that can be a problem. Um, some sexual reproduction, obviously, they need a sperm and an egg. That's how we're created. That's how a lot of animals are created. You're going to get half the traits from mom, half the traits from dad. That's just kind of how that goes. Some species actually, within their lifetime, within their life cycle, change between sexual and asexual. One of the ones that does this is a jellyfish. Pretty cool. They can do whatever they want. Not really whatever they want, but they change throughout their life cycle. Um, and many are able to do both sexually and asexually, depending on what's needed and what's going on out there. So, um, as I said, sponges have buds, um, but they can also reproduce sexually by releasing the sessile sponges. They actually release eggs and, and sperm at the same time to hopefully they get, um, they get fertilized. We actually talked about that in a different chapter where they take the ocean because of the current, they, they release them. They've actually learned to wind and do that. Pretty cool that they've done that. Um, another one that does this is the star coral. They release millions of sperm and eggs, and it's going to be called spawning. Um, and so they're going to hope that they fuse and connect together to be able to reproduce. During the mass spawning, though, which is going to be a good thing and a bad thing, um, a lot of invertebrates and fish will actually take advantage of this because they know that they're there, and so they go and actually eat them. Um, so with mass reproduction, it actually happens with other marine animals. Can anyone think of any? You probably should be able to think of one, one that we kind of talked about la in the last, cha uh, last chapter, chapter before that, I think it was chapter before that. Turtles. Turtles and fish and squid and clams, they all reproduce um, have mass reproduction because they want to ensure that their species is continued. Some species, like the flatworm, um, are hermaphrodites. So they will fight to become the male because they don't want to carry the eggs because whoever loses has to carry the eggs and they'll become the female. So they will, depending on what's going on, they fight to become the male and whichever happens, happens. And then there are some species that change their sex to accommodate reproduction. So if there are too many males, they'll become female. If there are too many females, they'll become male. So whatever the, whatever is needed is what they become. Pretty amazing what can happen in our na in nature to make sure that species are continued. Um, and some species then are also determined by the temperature of the water. We also know that about turtles, depending on the temperature, will depend on their sex. Um, mollusk, which is like a clam, um, actually depends on the gender which is above them. So the mollusk attaches to the substrate or to a, a rock or whatever they're attaching to. And then the next one, and they will start off as a male. And then the next one will go on top of them. And then they will become, the bottom one will become a female. And the top one is now a male. And depending on which, however many are stacked up, depends on what they're going to be, whether they're male or female, to reproduce. Um, <clears throat> so if you have a, a species that, is a parent and spends a lot of time with their with their offspring or trying to have an offspring, they're gonna have fewer babies. So you have our like our Adelaide penguins, they spend a lot of time taking care of their egg and they're very proud of those eggs and they only have one mate for life. 
pretty cool. Um, and then, so they, whichever one is gonna stay on there, is gonna incubate the egg while the other one goes and gets food for both of them. And then they will rotate and then they take care of that baby until they're actually able to do themselves, take care of themselves. A lot of birds in the marine birds will do the same thing. They are, some of them will actually have elaborate dances and to attract their prey or to attract their, not their prey, sorry, and attract their mate. They want to look pretty. And it's usually the guys that are doing this, not the girls. So it's kind of opposite for us. Um, seahorses, pretty interesting with seahorses. Um, so male seahorses actually incubate the eggs. So the female deposits the eggs into the male pouch and they don't give them any nutrients, they just incubate them. But what's really interesting is that if they are in the same area once they hatch and the female is still there, the females then, or the moms will then go and eat the baby eggs or the baby seahorses. I used to raise seahorses, so I know that. We used to have to take the female out to be able to make sure and ensure that the seahorses continue to grow the babies. So we got more of them and they didn't die off because they're really, really fragile. And then moving on to sharks. Sharks are pretty cool because they do a lot of different things. Um, so a lot of sharks will lay eggs outside um, externally. And what they do is they have this big old pouch. It's like a leather pouch. Um, they actually call it a mermaid pouch. Um, and they have their eggs there and they go and deposit their eggs in a cave or wherever they deposit. And they hatch. They survive. They survive. They don't. They don't. They, whatever happens, happens. Um, and then they actually can have some where they incubate the eggs completely and then they give birth they give live births kind of like what we do um and then some of them when they have the eggs inside some of them will hatch inside first and then what happens so some of them will hatch first and then they'll start their predatory um acquisitions already and they'll start to eat their other babies or their other brothers and sisters if they're not hatched yet they'll go and eat the eggs or they'll eat the other sharks that are there already starting that competition um, some of them that do this are going to be like your Mako and your Thrasher sharks. Those are the ones that kind of go in there and, do, and eat those. And then we have our pinnipeds, our cetaceans, our shrimpians, and polar bears that we just learned about last chapter um, that they give you the most parental care. So they have the fewest amount of babies. Um, a blue whale is another, is obviously one of our cetaceans. So a blue whale, um, their gestation is about a year. That's a long time. That's longer than what we go. We go nine months, a year, another three months. Can you imagine? Uh, no. Um, and then they spend about six months nursing their baby. And within that time, that calf can gain about 250 pounds a day. A day! Can you imagine 250 pounds a day? That's a lot. Um, for the first six months. And then between seven and ten years is when they actually reach sexual maturity. So one of the other things that I'm going to show you in my house so I can ask you a question at the end um, is I'm going to show you my little dolphin over here. He's really cute. See? And then I have three more that are right there. Yeah, kind of cool. That's part of my house. Hope you guys are having a great day. Stay safe. Stay healthy. Bye.